A note to the listeners, the stories in episode 83 do contain some explicit language. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. My Last Husband by Mary J. Breen Another one called last night. That makes six, not counting Yvonne, his first wife. She at least has a right to call, but these others, I wonder if they even think before they pick up the phone. Do they suppose I would be happy to find there are more and more of Clifford's old friends out there? Do they think it wouldn't bother me to be reminded that he could be a bastard? I suppose each one might think she's the only one. The last one went on and on, shocked and surprised that she was speaking with Clifford's wife. I don't know if she was surprised to hear he was still married to anyone, or surprised he was still married to me. It was almost ten when she rang. Foghorns were groaning out in the bay, and the wind was whipping the trees along the side of the house. I grabbed it on the first ring as I was expecting Beth. She phoned nearly every night to see how her father and I are doing. Clifford had called me a couple times earlier, saying someone was knocking on the bedroom window. He laughed, saying it might be Catherine Earnshaw. But when I said it was just the wind, he stared at me as if to say I was the foolish one. These calls all started after Clifford's son mentioned his stroke to someone who knew someone, who still goes to Clifford's old church in Vancouver. And she told the priest, and the priest asked the congregation to pray for him. God, he'd hate to know that. But he never will. And so the calls have begun. It isn't hard to find a C. Trellingham booth in San Francisco. Why couldn't I have married a John Brown? Beth's husband is a portrait painter, and he did a lovely painting of Clifford last year, not long before it all happened. You can still see the old Clifford there, his determination and his brash quickness, but it's all gone now. Mostly he just stares with a terrible vacant look. Even though his crying upsets me deeply, it's better than the living dead. You're wondering how I can say things like this? May you never find out. I suppose before long I'll be able to say that's my last husband painted on the wall. I'm not sure he even knew me when I brought in his breakfast this morning. But when I went in to collect the dishes and get him up, the old Clifford was back again. Well, back as much as he ever can be now. That's the way it is. He's here, and then he's not. At first I thought each time he returned that meant things were okay again, but of course I was wrong. Nothing is as it was. Last night he called me Molly, which is nearly right. Nearly, but not right. I need him to still know my name. And now these damned old friends, they're all women, are coming out of the woodwork and I'm getting obsessed with knowing how many of them were more than old friends. Most of them are before my time, but it turns out not all. The one who called yesterday morning told me I should tell him she's never forgotten that night at the folk festival. That was in 2009. I remember he told me he was going with a friend. I wasn't there because I stayed behind to have a wisdom tooth removed. That should have been a sign. I can't bear to think that the last ten years of my life are a sham. If not a sham, then a straw house built on sand quicksand. Maybe when the next one calls, I'll say, just think it could be you changing his diaper every morning. The one last night, Caroline, unnerved me. Of course it's worse when they call when I'm very tired. Such a sexy voice. She said she just heard, and she absolutely had to call. When I told her he couldn't handle phone calls, she said, but what harm can there be in contacting him now at this late date? She's not the first one to ask that as if destroying my happy memories, my trust, were an insignificant thing, that their once knowing and loving him conquered all. I'm learning to be brief. Yes, he has some difficulties, but we're managing, and no, he isn't up to talking on the phone. Not yet. She went on to say she can't stand the idea of Clifford's sweet soul not being somewhere on God's earth, and it broke her heart to know he wasn't well, and she couldn't help him. When I didn't say much, She took on a scolding tone and said I should be sensible and realize she was no danger to my happiness living so far away. She made me promise I'd tell him that she still loves him, but I won't. 
I think it would only confuse him and upset him and upset me. I actually believed he left all those women behind for me. After all, he married me. But I guess I wasn't enough. I want to say he's mine now, though not for long. But I know I'd start crying if I said that. I so much want some reassurance from him, but I don't know how to get it. I must be very careful. I must decide what I want to know and what I don't, because I'm not at all sure he knows any longer how to lie. Hello there. Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. So that's where we are today in those middle of the night, can't sleep, uncomfortable moments of things that we miss and things that have kept us up and things that were not as they seem. It seems appropriate to launch the summer this way, as I think summer for a lot of us is a time of sleepless nights. It's hot. I don't know about you all, but I do not live in an air-conditioned space, and so on hot summer nights I am sometimes kept up, and the mind goes strange places, doesn't it? The stories we're hearing today are heavy, and so we're going to break them up a little bit with some lightness and some fun things. Today is one of those days where I have a million announcements. And if you've listened to this before, you know that I hate doing announcements. They annoy me. It takes away from what it is we're trying to do here, which is create art. I feel like I'm just reading and reading to you. But I want to talk to you because you're the listeners and I want you to know all of the exciting things that's going on. And there's a lot going on. So I tried a grand experiment, story of my life, and I wrote the announcements as a short story. And it came out, I'm not going to lie, a little hokey. A little campfire story-ish reminds me of a camp director I once had. But I'm going to throw it at you anyway because it's more fun to read you a story than it is to read you some announcements. So I'm going to do that and there will be links in the show notes to all of the things that are mentioned in the story. So when I say show notes, every episode comes with a set of them, tells you a little bit about the stories, tells you a little bit about the contributors. There's two ways to find those. You can go to noextrawords.wordpress.com. The latest show notes are always there or you can search by episode. Or whatever you're listening to this on, if you're listening in your Apple podcast app or if you're listening in another podcast app, there's usually a little information or a triple dot button right next to the episode you're listening to. Hit that and it will show you the show notes for this episode. So that's kind of a shortcut, podcast listener to podcast listener, if you're trying to figure out what the heck is she talking about? Because of course, Writing Spaces is coming and you're going to want to see those pictures. So it's nice to know where that's coming from. So links to everything talked about in the story will be in the show notes. And here, without further ado, is Camp Counselor Chris's Campfire Story, featuring all of my announcements. There was once a podcast with two wise guardians. These were called Submissions and Promotion. Submissions was an eager young guardian, always wishing to please offering would-be podcast contributors promotion and easy participation for sharing their work. Content, so submissions would say, is king, and we must always be focused on how to make the show better. The podcast host had a fondness for submissions and would usually listen to his voice first. Promotion was a grand old dame, the sort of person that might talk in your ear too much during a party, but who is always good for a good story and a quick laugh. You are not meant to love promotion, but to tolerate her, and to be occasionally amused by her. Without being heard and seen, there is, of course, no podcast, so the podcast host would listen to her incessant nagging, when necessary. The podcast grew, and as it grew, it needed something else. A third guardian tried a few times to make entry, but one does not become a guardian overnight. After two years... This guardian arrived in the inner circle, and even then, the others regarded her with some suspicion. I am support, she said, confidently, but quietly. I don't know if we have room for you here, growled promotion. I do a lot of that work. We have to stay a small group, submissions insisted. Without me, we are nothing. I understand, 
said support, trying to be, well, supportive. But we have a purpose here. We are growing. We are building. Change is inevitable. I came because I was needed. Not this episode, said Promotion disagreeably. There is something called Instagram and the new land of YouTube. I have much to say to the people. You can wait. I need to speak, said Submission, standing on tiptoes to appear taller. I am small, but I am needed. You must ask the listeners to build me up. You can't delay my arrival, said Support. I am new and must speak. You cannot drown me out. I must tell the listeners of Patreon and of personal recommendation. Personal recommendation is my field, growled Promotion, and so the argument went on. In the end, the three went to the podcast host, who considered them carefully. You know I always favor submissions and his elder sister contributors, but the others are right. There is much going on, and we must work together to build the future. All are important. I will tell the listeners of submissions, and of how we need new energy to keep us going, but I also must tell them of promotion, and send them to the lands of Instagram and YouTube. And support? Support is a special friend to whom they must be carefully introduced. They must know of the ways they can help. When introduced right, support will empower them. You probably shouldn't try to squeeze in too many extras then, said Submissions, wide beyond his years. With all of that to say. It was good advice, but much as she loved her friend Submissions, the podcast host was sometimes better at talking than at listening. So without expanding too much more on all of that... I want to get you back to stories. Writing Spaces is back. This episode with two of our former contributors telling us where they write. Stephen Mayoff is up first. Stephen Mayoff writes from Prince Edward Island, Canada, which is a place I've never been to but always imagine that I know, as do I think a lot of people who've read certain books from there. Um, and I love one of the stories Stephen shared with us on an episode last summer. He It's actually called The Two Ands, and I think in my introduction to it I wrote, it's Two Ands of Prince Edward Island, Canada, but it's not what you think. Um, Stephen shared two short stories with us in the past and is here to tell us where he writes. And then next after him is Rachel Lyon. Rachel shared with us a story just before Mother's Day last year. That's a fun one. So links to the episodes that Stephen and Rachel were on before are in those show notes, as are links to pictures of their writing spaces. Rachel especially gave us several detailed pictures of the things she talks about. So if you want to see them, check out your show notes for that. F- immediately following that, a piece of microfiction which we don't get enough of around here. Um, 150 word short story, 150 word or less short story. And then I will be back to introduce another segment. I'm telling you, the story was correct. I don't know when to stop. But to introduce another quick segment that is new to this episode before we round you out with a third story. So with all that going on, I'm getting you straight to dun da 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 writing spaces. So this is my home office, and I've written here for about uh, the last 14 years. It's a small space, about eight and a a half feet by nine feet. Uh, It's painted eggshell blue, a nice light cool color that uh, I chose specifically because I thought it would be easier on the eyes and um, hopefully a bit more conducive to concentration. And it feels uh, very insular to be in here, sort of almost like uh, being inside an egg waiting for ideas to hatch. Uh, The room's best feature is a window, which you can't see in the picture. Uh, Just to the right, um, uh, it looks out uh, over at the trees and river uh, behind our house. Uh, It's a pleasant departure from the uh, eggshell walls, and uh, there are also a couple of uh, bookshelves on the other walls. Uh, The large picture above my desk shows three children, uh, one of whom has his arms outstretched, and there are two birds beside it. Um, uh, the picture was made with pastels by my uncle, Len Flegel, uh, who's an artist and a retired art teacher. I have a couple of his other works also on another wall in the office and uh, just in the hallway outside. Um, he's one of the few artistic members of my family, and I've uh, always considered him a kind of influence on my uh, choice to be a writer. And I feel that uh, having his artwork in this room uh, gives it, a, I guess, a sense of lineage, uh, almost a kind of uh, permission to be uh, creative. So next to the picture, there's a cork board. 
And on that uh, are a bunch of, uh, I guess, artifacts uh, of various importance uh, to my private and writing lives uh, I've collected throughout the years. Uh, there's a collection of ID badges that uh, I've got from uh, workshops and conferences that I attended. Um, near the ID badges is an American $5 bill uh, that I earned from having a poem published online. I sort of think of it like a a shop displaying uh, the first dollar it earned. Uh, On the board's lower left side, there's a postcard of Samuel Beckett's famous quote, uh, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And uh, below that is an airmail envelope with two other quotes on it, uh, one from John Berriman, we must travel in the direction of our fear, and the other by Rainer Maria Rilke, our deepest fears are like dragons guarding our deepest treasures. At the top of the board, there are some postcards of uh, James Joyce, Oscar Wilde, Dylan Thomas. I bought those at the Portrait Gallery in London. In general, I, I, I consider this corkboard a kind of, um, I guess, a reflection of my disorderly mind uh, with all of its uh, influences and aspirations. So in the picture, you can see that the, the desk is quite uh, cluttered, and uh, that's its usual state until I'm... Uh, annoyed enough to uh, clear away a bit of the clutter. Uh, I generally write at the desk, although I sometimes uh, take my laptop over to the armchair that's also in the room, uh, which you can't see in the photo. Um, And and finally, if you want to contact me about uh, uh, my writing space or about my writing, uh, go to my website, www.stephenmayoff.ca, and uh, you can email me from there. Thanks a lot. Bye. Hi, this is Rachel Lyon talking about my writing space for No Extra Words. So I write in a corner of my room. I live in Brooklyn where space is limited, but actually I have a a pretty big apartment for the neighborhood. I live with three roommates and two cats. And my writing space is by my bedroom window. I like to surround myself with the things that matter to me and that have, you know, particular stories. So from my lamp, there's a little bird ornament that a poet friend gave to me, Nandi Comer, a couple years ago for Christmas. Um, Hanging in my window, there's, there's an angel in stained glass that came from my grandmother. I have a red balloon that I got as a souvenir in Venice, hanging in the left hand pane. And a little, a little glass lion that I also got in Venice. Uh, you can probably see there's a cat cave <laughs> in front of the window. So sometimes when I'm writing, my my cat Simone will crawl in there and hang out with me. Once in a while, Thompson will come too. He's the other one. Um, and then I have two beautiful plants. <laughs> I don't know the name of the one on the right. Um, the one on the left is a fern. I got them both at the, um, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, which is right across the street from my house. So I downsized my job to two days a week recently. And, um, and now when I write at home during the day, I can often hear children in the schoolyard across the street yelling and screaming and running around. So that brings a kind of liveliness to my workspace you can see in the picture there's the most recent version of my novel which my editor sent back to me with comments so I've been working today on implementing those comments if you want to visit me online you can visit www.rachellion.work and thanks for listening
I Had Children in a Dream by Stacy Stepanovich. Four hours and seventeen minutes into a sound sleep, I wake from a dream that I need to remember. A chapel with red double doors, each with a pane of tinted glass, pale faces pressed against stained glass. The chapel was in a place that looked like my hometown. A river flowed where there used to be a railroad. Water poured over boulders that looked like pebbles from the long bridge that spanned the valley. I walked across the bridge into town, only stopping once I reached the chapel. I was much older than I am now, and my children were inside. They were crying. Though I could touch the glass, I felt far from them. They were like the railroad that no longer existed. Four little blonde girls, looking very much like I did when I was young. Their eyes were red. Their faces were losing color. Hello, listeners. It's Chris again. You remember hearing from our short story that contained all of our announcements that there's a new character in our show called Support. And this is an opportunity for you, the listeners. I end every episode telling you that the best way that you can support the show is by recommending us to your family and friends. That remains 100% true. It's still the very best way that you can offer support to us. But we are expanding. We are growing and we wanted to empower you, those of you that have been with us for a while, to think of some different ways you can support us on this journey towards sharing this wonderful form of flash fiction and digital storytelling with the world. So in addition to supporting us by recommending us, you can support us by leaving us a review on whatever podcast app you're listening to right now. You can support us by submitting your story and becoming part of the family. And we are offering as we enter into year three, another option for support. It's just one of the options for support. But if you would like to support the show financially, that would be a big help to us. Nobody connected with the show is making any money off of it, but there is a cost to running it. And your financial support would help ensure that we can keep doing this in the long term. So we are working with a third party donation site called Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. And writers, musicians, podcasters, filmmakers, all kinds of artists use Patreon as a way to get financial support for their art. And as a librarian, I love the word patron. It has this kind of old world connotation of being a patron of the arts, which is what we're inviting you to do. So if the spirit moves you to support the show financially, you can visit patreon.com slash no extra words. And our donation levels start at $2 a month, which is less than a dollar an episode. If 10 people gave $2 a month, that would really shore up kind of the baseline for keeping the show funded. And anything above and beyond that would give us the ability to do extra things. We had purchases of extra equipment so we can do interviews and things like that. And those costs are ongoing. So that's an opportunity for you if you would like to step into that role of financial supporter. $2 a month would be great. $5 a month would be twice as great. If you feel compelled to give more, we do have rewards for the higher levels. So if you want personal thank yous and shout outs and beta reads and stuff like that, that's all available over there. If you have the ability to contribute financially at a higher level, we'd love to have you. But really, I'm looking for donors at that $2 and $5 a month level. So check us out over there. I did a kind of a little FAQ video that just goes into more detail, talks about a little more about what Patreon is and how it works and why we're doing this and where the money's going to go. That's beyond the scope of this episode. I've already gotten to announcement like, but if you visit us over there at patreon.com slash no extra words, or even our website, no extra words.wordpress.com. If you have any of those questions about those details, all that information is there. If financial support is not something that's available, that's within your means right now, I totally get it completely understandable and so think about the other ways that you can support the show who have you recommended us to lately you know can you give us a social media blast any of those things all of those things help in that spirit i have a new segment that i'm sharing on this show 
and it is a Google poem. Google Poetry is a writing exercise that I've done for years and used to teach when I was working in schools. We've been playing a lot with found poetry. You may have heard of our Instagram challenge going on. If you haven't, go back to the special episode just before this one. You can hear all the details there. And found poetry is something we've been playing with. Google Poetry is a cool way of kind of harnessing found poetry and shaping found poetry. And so I'm going to share a Google poem inspired by the titles of the stories in this episode. Google poem that I wrote, and I will tell you, it's terrifying for me to share my poetry. I don't think of myself as a poet. It's not an area of writing that I feel comfortable working in. It scares me to death. But I'm about to read it to you. Hope that you enjoy it. If you would like to know how it was written, if you would like to go behind the scenes, I'm offering a little how-to video of this writing exercise to our patrons over on Patreon. So if you become a financial supporter, that's one of the little perks that I'm going to throw your way. Um, That's a supporter at any level. Just my way of saying thank you for joining us as we launch this first ever financial fundraising campaign. And so again, this is terrifying for me to share this with you. But without further ado, I'd like to share with you a poem inspired by today's episode. And it's simply titled Lost Sleep. Ruth lost everything. Lost sleep can take a toll. It's totally dysfunctional, trying to be companionable. We lost a dear friend. Sitting on the couch and sleeping decays the mind and body. Don't get all tweaked out, losing track of the larger context. Keep an eye out and call me. Be not as available emotionally. Take it on completely the way we learned as kids. Don't lie in bed trying to sleep. Lost sleep can take a toll. Three in the morning, and you don't smoke anymore, by Peter J. Stavros. It's that thing that wakes you at three in the morning, with a gasp and a startle, brain addled, pulse pounding, the pillow and sheets sweat soaked. You roll over to the nightstand for a cigarette before you realize you don't smoke anymore. Quit years ago, but it still remains that muscle memory to reach for something, no matter how toxic, when you sense yourself sinking. You unfold out of bed, this leg, then that leg, pause for a beat to acclimate to upright, sort of, before stumbling down the stairs, clumsy against the rail, the hardwood creaking, that one nail on the next to last step that always snags your sock, goddammit, boxers and v-neck damp, clingy. You check the air conditioner, running full blast, Set it 62. 62? You jump to adjust to something more sensible. 70 at least. The unit outside clanking off with a rattle of hard metal. Christ, who set this thing at 62? You would never be so cavalier with the thermostat. And thinking like that makes you feel like your dad. You resist the urge to rummage through your desk drawer for a crinkled pack of marble lights that might have gotten shoved way in because even if it had, it would have long been pillaged by you by now. It's no use, you know, but you go to your desk nonetheless, something draws you, and the chair you stole from the last place you worked, those assholes who were too cheap to offer you severance. You had to take something for your time, so rather than abscond with a briefcase of office supplies like any normal person, or a wad of petty cash stuffed into your overcoat pocket, you took a shitty chair, rolled it down the hallway as security escorted you from the building. You never even liked that chair, the insufferable squeaking at the slightest shifting of position, but you had to take something, and now here it is in your house, squeaking, squeaking, squeaking as you sit at your desk and open your laptop for some reason, some reason that escapes at three in the morning, your damp underwear. You log on, you log in, and there, then you remember why you woke up with a gasp soaked in sweat. It's her. You see her like you used to see her. Older, of course. What's it been? Ten years? No, more. But still the same, sort of. You see those lips, 
those eyes, the button nose, the unruly shock of platinum blonde hair. Not natural, not what God gave her, but it suits her. The mermaid tattoo from Key West. It's her. You know it's her. Older, but still it's her. Smiling, contented. She's standing on some anonymous beach with some anonymous kid. Some kid who looks like her. It's her kid. Her son. They told you it's her son. Is that really her son? He looks like her, and not like his father, whoever that is. And why isn't he in the picture, although you suspect maybe he took the picture, but you would rather just consider him out of the picture? He's a good-looking kid. Tall, towers over her, but she's small. You always teased. Yet even so, a kid that big and good-looking, with all her best features and nothing from his father, whoever that is? You see that. You saw that. And still cannot believe it. And now you can't stop staring. It's why everything that used to be you and her rewinds into place, sort of. Grainy footage from another era. How she smelled. How she tasted. How she felt brushed up against you, soft and safe. How she pleaded that crisp autumn night right before she left if you would ever settle down. And you could not articulate an answer to make her stay. You reach for your breast pocket for a cigarette. But you don't have a breast pocket and you don't smoke anymore anyway. Quit because of her. Because she hated the smell. And what it did. And she wanted you to be healthy. You would go on those ridiculous long runs with her in the park. Panting and coughing and struggling not to vomit. Just to be with her. And you would pretend those runs were the best ever while secretly longing to lounge on the stoop inhaling deep, satisfying drags from one of the stash of cancer sticks, she called them. You managed to hide from her. It's that thing that makes you wonder what the hell you have been doing with your life these many years while she was raising a good-looking kid with all her best features who towers over her. You, sitting in your damp underwear in a shitty chair you stole from those assholes who fired you for no other reason than that they didn't want you there anymore. You, in the same place you have always been, at this starter home you bought when you first moved to town, and here you are, still not started. You resist the urge to pull on a pair of sweats and wander down the street to that gas station with the buzzy neon beer signs that never closes for a pack of something and a bottle of something, only because you don't want to go to the trouble. Instead, you sigh, shut the laptop, rise from the chair, squeaking, 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 and slurp two handfuls of water from the bathroom sink, splash what's left on your face, then head upstairs to bed. Toss the pillow, peel off the sheets, lie on the mattress, the plastic covering sticking to your moist skin, grabbing slightly and releasing with every heavy breath. All you want is to fall asleep, to be done with this day and endless night, because tomorrow might be different, better maybe. Tomorrow you might do something. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information about today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. If you would like to support the show, please tell a few friends about us, or you can visit patreon.com slash noextrawords to pledge your financial support. See you next time.